Hey all and welcome back for another set of Hellfire comms, Patreon TV comms. And we've got quite the selection for you today. You can even call this a variety hour because we're checking out three separate television shows today. Luckily, the rips we have of them are all the same frame rate so I can put them in the same video. But what are we watching? Well, first up we'll be watching Season 6, Episode 8 of Archer, The Canes. Then we'll be moving on to Season 3, Episode 3 of Rick and Moy, for Pickle Rick, obviously. And then we'll be finishing up with some Venture Brothers, Season 4, Episode 2, Handsome Ransom. I made sure to check those were the right descriptions for each episode, so if they're wrong, blame Wikipedia. All these were commissioned by Mauricio Cuervo, obviously. One commission, three videos. You can mix and match it if you like, but are you ready, Volk, for a bit of Archer? I am ready to go. Archer is actually one of the is the one in this set of three that I actually have the least amount of experience with. So I'm going into this with very little first-hand knowledge. So I'm looking forward to seeing what this is like. Well, I, I guess I'll wait until we get into the video to uh, discuss my history with Archer. Everything you need to sync up our commentaries to your video clips, which can't, we can't provide, copyright, yada yada, can be found in the video description. There's instructions, etc. Check that if you're confused. Otherwise, here we go. We're going to count you down into Archer, and then when that's done, close the video down, set up uh, Rick and Morty, and while we talk about Archer, blah, 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 and so on and so forth. All right, here we go. In three, two, one. Okie okay, Koki, the Canes. So, for those of you who don't know what Archer is, I'm just going to read you the basic conceit. Archer is an American adult animated sitcom created by Adam Reed for the basic cable network FX. It follows the exploits of a dysfunctional group of secret agents. Sterling Archer, voiced by H. John Benjamin, who you may know is Coach McGurk from home movies and stuff like that, and uh, several of his colleagues, Mallory Archer, who's his mother, Lana Kane, who's played by Asia Tyler, she's the uh, woman here, Cheryl Tunn, voiced by Judy Greer, Pam Poovey, Amber Nash, Ray Gillette, or Reed, Cyril Figgist, voiced by Chris Barnell, and Dr. Algonop Krieger, voiced by Lucky Yates. The premise of Archer evolves in subsequent seasons as the show experiments with the standard setup of an anthology, each with self-contained arcs, new settings, and a disparate set of personae for each character, even distinct humour. Funny thing, the agency they worked for to begin with, do you know what it was actually called, Rog? I have no idea. <laughs> It was actually called Isis. Oh, okay. I can probably see why they would have changed that then. I think it actually changed in this season. But anyway, the uh, the concept of the episode we're watching is um, basically Archer and Lana are going to meet Lana's parents, the Canes. So, yeah, they'll get introduced to uh, their grandson and antics will incur. Uh, and I imagine with all that beer, antics will indeed occur. <laughs> it's like, even so much that she needs a beer. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, with Archer, I actually binged, like, the first two to three seasons, and I ended up completely burning myself out on it, because it's a very funny show, at least what I watched of it. But it's also kind of samey humour, so like, you get the benefit if you watch, like, an episode per week. I don't think it's really made for binge-watching. Oh, that's fair enough. I mean, not every show is made to be binge like that. It's one of those things where they're sort of expecting you to watch it episode by episode, so that after a while you sort of watch an episode, you get comfortable with it, and then afterwards it hits you with another one, and at that point... You don't really notice if the humour is similar to one another. <laughs> Fucking Archer. I love H. John Benjamin. I have to admit, I haven't heard of him in a while. Of course, I know about him from the uh, home movies things, like you mentioned before, <laughs> but besides that, I don't recall watching him anywhere else. Hmm, interesting. Well, maybe while the opening credits play, I will lock up all the stuff he's been in. I'm trying to find it very quickly. All right. H. John Benjamin. Uh, let's see. Stuff you might know. Not another teen movie. Uh, this is film. Should probably go to, like, voice acting and whatnot. Let's have a look here. Uh, Dr. Katz, Professional Therapist. Uh, Chris Rock Show. Sex in the City. Home Movies, obviously. Uh, he was in Space Ghost Coast to Coast as himself. Uh, he was Aqua Teen, Hunger Force as various voices. Uh, let's see. The Venture Bros as The Master. Ah, okay. I'm not sure if I remember the master specifically, but um, we'll be getting into the Venture Brothers later on, so <laughs> yes, we I'll will. wait on that one. Oh, of course, he was Bob Belcher in Bob's Burgers. Oh, okay. I haven't actually watched Bob's Burgers properly yet, so that would explain why I haven't heard of him there. Otherwise, it would have been easy. 
Um, I do actually have a cookbook based around Bob's Burgers and all the recipes that they made in um, the show. So that's something from Bob's Burgers I have, but I never actually sat down and watched the show. I'm not entirely sure if this is his adoptive like son slash daughter or the biological one. I am obviously not up to date on my archer lore and whatnot. It may be safe to say the latter, but you know, we should never really assume. Oh, I would recognize Keith David's timber and tone anywhere. <laughs> you are quite the fan of Keith David, if I remember correctly. I am, mate, I am. So I would say Archer oftentimes falls into the category of uh, cringe comedy a little bit. I guess like The Office and whatnot. Uh, well, obviously we have like Austin Powers probably to thank for its inception and the like. But um, I, it's not really my type of humor most of the time. I've got to be honest with you. Nah, I mean, I would say that perhaps the ultimate in cringe humor that's around at the moment is anything that's made by Tim Heidecker and Eric Wareheim at the moment. But um, this seems like maybe a lighter sort of cringe, maybe sort of along the lines of uh, Tom Goes to the Mayor sort of deal, but maybe a little bit more high-tech in terms of its uh, animation and its art style. Although the more I'm watching this, the more I think back to my art class, because the art style itself very much reminds me of, like, those pop-art paintings that you'd see from, like, uh, Roy Lichtenstein, I think his name was. Oh, wow, you're just throwing out, like, fancy names at me right now, Van. Well, that's not quite as fancy, but, you know what, we'll take it. <laughs> Alright, so, uh, there's a hologram waifu, apparently, so, uh, that's apparently a thing that occurred. <laughs> that's the Doctor's digital waifu. Don't ask, I'd be here all day explaining. <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> I mean, it's true, but she shouldn't say it. No, there are some things you just don't say out loud. <laughs> Ah, I see. He's flexing. He's flexing that MD or PhD. I can never tell the difference between the two. Well, I'm not sure about PhD, but he certainly is flashing a D of some description. I don't think Archer and Lana are ever actually married, so this isn't like his father-in-law or anything. It's more just a uh, extended boyfriend-girlfriend kind of dealio. I'm not even sure if they're actually in a relationship at this point in time, but, uh, you know, I'm sure people can tell us in the comments and whatnot. I, I have stopped watching Archer for the longest time now. I probably should get back into it, actually. I might do at some point, but of course, with all the other stuff that I have to watch, I have to admit it's not far in the front lines at the moment, but who knows? Maybe the next 15 minutes or so will change that. Awkward. There are some things that you don't share. The hot tub is pretty much the non-sharing zone. He's being oddly specific. He's like, all right, here are my list of demands. It wasn't a fucking threesome, Archer. You, he's such a goddamn clod. I love him. He is a very lewd forted man by the sounds of it. Why not just spay him? <laughs> yeah, just spay him and get it over with, really. I think he was in a coma at one point. That's kind of the same thing, really. Well, I mean, you can't get your rocks off if you're in a coma, I guess. <laughs> well, I direct you to uh, the first Kill Bill movie, my friend. Oh, yeah, that was a thing, wasn't it? Hmm, okay, never mind. <laughs> oh. 
God, it just never it never rains but it pours here on Archer. Alright, well, what's up next? First proposition, threesome, and now Okay, so AJ is his biological daughter, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> Come on, there's enough room for both of you. Just go in one at a time. Really? You kind of like stereotyping everyone here. You kind of like throwing in some primary colors. Well, I don't know. I'm not a. I'm not a thief. Baby dot wave. Well, we could go with the obvious answer of this is America, but uh. <laughs> Let's not go down that route. I'm not sure if they know that Lana works for, like, secret agencies and whatnot. Probably not. I mean, that's the sort of thing you try and keep hush-hush about, even with your family. <laughs> God, I could just listen to Keith David talk for 20 minutes at a time, which is just why this episode works for me. They should just have, like, he should make, like, a web series where he just rants about things. Um, David Mitchell did something similar, and I watched that for quite a while. I get the feeling Keith David would be pretty good at that, too. Oh, David Mitchell Soapbox. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> oh, the frame it. I love the fact that they're just having this whole thing whilst there are robbers, like, getting away with algae or whatever the fuck it was. Yeah, let me actually look into what they stole here. I got, like, ten billion things open. Uh, alright, let's see. Uh, oh, Lana's father is a microbiologist, and his research has been stolen by a team of masked gunmen. These are the other characters I mentioned, by the way. Which I think are part of a bowling squad? I don't know. At this point, they could be literally anything. <laughs> I mean, she's pretty good from what I can tell. She could be like a strong woman or something similar, just like dragging up a van uphill whilst the brake was on. I mean, that's an achievement. Uh, yeah, she's, um, I think that's Pam. I want to say Pam Poovy. Yeah, voiced by Amber Nash. Let me just uh, right click. Uh, yep, yep, lots of pictures of her looking drunk in the cartoon. It's her. <laughs> I love how I can just tell by the amount of toxicity she's under. Yep, she's drunk. Must be her. Oh. <laughs> Archer is very stupid, by the way, so don't worry if he's not always quick on the uptake. Wow, that's actually a game changer when you think about it. Yep, I mean, you use it and it turns into something even more useful, arguably. I mean, you can get much better than that. I mean, sure beats the shit out of some of the other alternate methods people have come up with so far, like vegetable oil and things like that. <laughs> if you're wondering, yes, this is one big homage to Bullet. <laughs> I believe it's pronounced Philistines. Yeah, he's definitely not in the know, is Lana's father. He is as out the loop as it gets. <laughs> I always find it amusing how they could just have casual conversation whilst there's literal gunfighting and car chases going on. That just goes to show how much in their element they actually are here. I'm not entirely sure whether this is like scripted like home movies, but a lot of it does come off as like seemingly improv, which I guess was the intent. Yeah, it doesn't seem as obviously improvised as something like Rick and Morty, but I imagine they probably had some leeway with uh, some of the back and forth conversations going on. Here we go. The truth comes out, finally. <laughs> Not one gun, but two. Two! 
There was submachine guns too. She was packing heat. So don't tell me who to be angry at, you ass bucket. <laughs> Well, I mean, there's, like, plenty of countries out there willing to take on someone who can do the job. Mmm, absolutely. With enough money, you can turn anybody. This is giving me some major flashbacks to GTA San Andreas, by the way. A little bit, yeah. <laughs> It's just, it's just a whole idea of going around with a submachine gun, just gunning down every single person, like, purple attire that you find. It is a little bit like, um, oh, what was the middle, like, city called? Las Venturas? The middle city in San Andreas? San Fierro, there we go. Yeah, that was it. Yeah, because I know Los Santos was the third, but I didn't know what the second one was. No, Los Santos is the first, mate. Oh, was it? Oh. Wow, my memory of San Andreas is not as good as yours, it seems. Oh, we'll start when we have all the money and eventually become poorer and poorer over time. <laughs> ah, I see. It's a big pivotal episode, I suppose. I'm not entirely sure if the canes ever appear again, but there you go. Well... I mean, I can think of a few better places you can reconcile with the family, but I suppose when needs must, you have to compromise. <laughs> Everyone equally hates Archer. <laughs> well, you just had those heavy bowling balls in there the whole time he didn't say anything oh I was just holding on to it oh you son of a bitch I got a better idea why don't you all just get out and push oh uh, shit they bowled in the wrong neighborhood now <laughs> watch for hubcaps falling off that's the explicit bullet homage I'm pretty sure there was 30 seconds left before the car engine locked up. What the hell happened to that little little nugget of information? Time only moves when Archer is on screen, so just keep counting down. Alright. I didn't mean literally. Counting. God. <laughs> alright, alright. <laughs> There you go. <laughs> this really isn't the time, Archer. <laughs> it's like, do I need to bring coleslaw to this thing? Oh, uh, if we survive, yes. Just don't confuse it for my research. I mean, at least he's asking the important question as far as barbecuing is concerned, but this is not the time! Of course they know each other, of course they do. <laughs> That's a new one on me. As far as I was concerned, titties can fix everything. I just love the juxtaposition of the fucking hologram in the background. <laughs> <laughs> the bearded dude is the professor, by the way, or the doctor, if you will. I do recognize him from the meme of stop, my penis can only, only get, get so erect. erect. Yeah, of course. 
That's like the one bit of Archer that I know. Really? This? Oh. This has all just been a series of misunderstandings, hasn't it? <laughs> yeah, Ethan. Oh wait, is that actually Christian Slayer? I'm not entirely sure. You must look into this. We still have two minutes left. Go uh, on, you can do it. Uh, uh. Christian Slayer as Slater. Jesus. <laughs> so it's pretty much as himself. Keith David as Lemuel Kane and CCH Pounder as Claudette Kane. Woohoo! Hell yeah, capitalism for the win! It's like, dude, fuck the algae, I can get myself a mansion! Who gives a shit about humanity when you get money? <laughs> dollar dollar bills, yo! Well, that ended about as quickly as it began. That looks like a fucking model airplane. Yeah, I can't quite tell if it's meant to, those parts are meant to be in 3D or if it's just very well-drawn 2D. I'd wager it's probably 3D, just very heavily line-arted, but... Yeah. I can't really tell. Somebody in the comments might be able to uh, tell us how the actual animation works, but, uh... Well, that'll be for after the video. <laughs> I'm sorry that I thought your parents were inviting me to a threesome. <laughs> what an ending! Oh my god. I actually wasn't expecting that. Oh, wow! Oh, that was so well timed. Jesus. Oh, okay. Well, I don't think there's going to be a stinger on one, so uh, let's close down the video and load up, uh, well, I guess Rick and Morty. Now, what do you think of uh, Season 6, Episode 8 of Archer the Canes, mate? I'm not entirely sure how much of the overall show I really got from that one episode, but they really went ham on, like, the, mis the misunderstanding and reconciliation thing with, like, the agents, like, coming in, stealing someone's shit, and be like, oh, wait, I know that guy! And, you know, always getting in trouble with, like, the local gang. It's just like, oh, yeah, I beat your ass back in high school! And just the whole thing was based around that. I think they really did well with emphasizing the theme. And, of course, that's that bit at the end, like, oh, my God, that was so good. Indeed. Okay, I'm closing down all my Archer-specific things here. Let me just scroll back up. All right, time for a bit of uh, Rick and Morty. Are you ready for some Pickle Rick, folk? I'm as ready as I think I'll ever be. All right, here we go. Season 3, Episode 3 of Rick and Morty in 3, 2, 1. Okay, Rick and Morty is an American adult animated science fiction sitcom created by Justin Roiland and Dan Harmon. The series follows Rick, an alcoholic super scientist and his easily distressed yet good-hearted grandson Morty, on their adventures to alternate dimensions. These adventures commonly cause trouble for Morty's family who often get caught up in the mayhem. It's essentially like Back to the Future on crack. Yeah, I think that's probably the best way to describe it. And uh, yes, you are not mistaken that is indeed rick he's a bit of a big deal <sighs> big reveal rick turned himself into a pickle if you're wondering how that happened well we weren't commissioned to cover those episodes so fuck it i think we can just boil it down to rick just does whatever the fuck he wants because he can that yeah that's new yeah i'll give you that I'm not sure if it's entirely because it's new or that nobody else is stupid enough to have tried it in the first place. Yeah, I'm going to be honest, the only, like, Rick and Morty related thing I've watched all the way through was like an 11 minute shit post called Bushworld Adventures. Why do they have asses for faces? <laughs> <laughs> just don't involve. I'm not going to explain the whole Rick and Morty lore, okay? No, I was just going to say, when does Ben Affleck come into all of this? <laughs> 
But as far as Rick and Morty goes, I have watched through most of season one and most of season two. And I've watched maybe three or four episodes of season three. Ah. So I've been around and watched most of it, but it was mostly in sort of a sense of, I sort of think, hmm. I'd watch a couple of Rick and Morty clips and think, hmm, I feel like watching a bit of Rick and Morty, and I'd just select some episodes at random and just go from there. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, I watched Bush World Adventures, which like, I did some portal sites to be gone, and now I got a real gun! I got a real gun, Morty! <laughs> oh my god, that animation was so good. I had a riot with that one. Blonde-haired woman is Morty's mother, Rick's daughter, and I'm pretty sure the girl is Morty's sister. I'm not sure. Yeah, that's Summer, Morty's sister. You are absolutely correct. Oh, right, yeah, I forgot about the counselling angle. Season 3, I think, was meant to be a bit more grounded. Yeah, season 3 was essentially where... Well, obviously... I'll spoil things a little bit here, but at the end of season two, Rick ended up being put in, like, universe jail, for lack of a better descriptive term. Essentially, he got put in jail for everything. And he literally said to himself when one of his cellmates actually went, so what are you in here for? He just went, everything. Whoa, dude. And then it called zooms out. And uh, he eventually breaks out of prison, and then at that point, something happens, I don't quite remember what, but it results in Beth, who is... Rick's daughter and Jerry which is uh, Morty's father getting a divorce and the family counselling thing I believe plays in shortly after that whole situation occurs okay so there you go that's a, that's a good amount of context there for you to figure out what's going on here alright pick up your father put him in some brine we are going to this therapy session Just gonna leave him there? At least put him in the fridge. You know, it's a good thing that no one else is living in the house and just thought, hmm, really fancy a sandwich right now. Is this just gonna be the entire episode? <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't put it past him, honestly. It's just him passing time by by making random noises and humming to himself. That is a really damn fluffy cat. <laughs> they are Rick and Morty have one thing they do really really well as well as just their improv in general they do a shit ton of referential humour that I think people well versed in the internet would understand well I guess that gives it it's kind of like family guy appeal to you know compare it to something sort of similar yeah, it doesn't seem as random, but at the same time, I feel like anybody who's at least spent a little bit of time browsing videos around YouTube and checking out the odd meme here and there would be able to appreciate the comedy style. So the question remains, why a pickle? Why not some other type of vegetable? Uh, I don't know. Maybe they thought a tomato was a bit too cliche. Maybe they thought something like a broccoli was perhaps a little too much. Or maybe it's just the natural preservatives, who knows? I guess so. Well, now he's going to be preserved in rat shit, so good luck with her. Not entirely sure about this director's cut of Ratatouille. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's one advantage to being a pickle. No bones. Yes. Damn, suddenly all Ozzy Osbourne on this bitch. Uh, okay. <laughs> I don't like where this is going, Tom. <laughs> I'm just going to say this right now. He is going to be the pickle king of the fucking... <sighs> I'm not going to describe every sickening thing happening on screen. Courage is eating a gigantic hot dog. <laughs> Why is it in, like, those weird, like, box memes? <laughs> like, there's no, there's no subtext at the bottom. That's not how the meme works. Hey, we don't shame for that sort of thing, okay? Ah, 
I don't know who this character is, so sorry for lack uh, of context. That is, that is Morty's teacher. Ah, okay. Oh boy, she is in for a rough ride. Dedication. All right, let's do this. He turned himself into a fucking pickle, Doctor. <laughs> you could say he's gotten himself into a bit of himself right now. Bit of a briny situation. <laughs> Don't worry, I'll run out of pickle puns before long. <laughs> I've heard a lot of, like, divisive comments about this episode, especially, like, the ending speech from the Doctor and whatnot, so I'm just waiting to see how on the nose that is. Yeah, same here. Um, I never actually watched this episode. I guess maybe the whole Pickle Rick meme making its way around kind of turned me off the idea, or maybe I felt like, okay, so if that's basically the episode, that's pretty much it. So, I don't really need to watch it. I have... All the context I need. He turned himself into a pickle, crazy shit happens, that's pretty much it. I'm sure there's like underlying subtext and whatnot, but the, the general joke is he is a pickle. Jesus, nicely timed. I would not want to be where this guy is during, like, a battle royale situation. I think he'd be too good. Uh, Rick plays Fortnite. There's a video idea for YouTube. Actually, Rick and Morty as... Well, Rick and Morty themselves, rather, have actually featured in video games in the past. He, they were actually, um, optional commentators for Defense of the Ancients 2. Huh. And, uh, he gets to join such legends as, uh, the narrator from the Stanley Parable as well, so... Yeah, they made it up to the point where they got to be um, narrators and commentators for Dota, so you know you made it when you get to that point. I didn't realise the show was going to be as bloody as this, like, right off the bat. Oh, this is this is no surprise to me. Like, even from season one, there is a lot of um, fairly graphic violence, but um, this is definitely one of the uh, gorier ones, like, no question about it. They probably got away with it because it's just like rats, you know? Yeah, maybe so. Who cares about the swamp vermin? <laughs> Wait, what syringe? <laughs> <laughs> she almost put her hand up there. <laughs> oh yeah, that's a very on-the-nose joke as well. Yeah, they do break the fourth wall quite often, although it's usually quite subtle. It's not usually as right in your face. Like, I think the most in your face it ever got was during the end of season one where they froze time and they were doing like the dance at the end to and shake that ass, bitch, and let me see what you got. And like Rick was basically going, no, that's it. That's the end of the season. <laughs> like, I think that's as much fourth wall breaking as they ever got in. Like, usually they're a little bit more clever and subtle about it. Mm. Also, I think they brought in new writers for this season, and like there was a lot of furore about how they're like all women and whatnot. I think one of those women writers actually did write this episode, so... I did not actually know that. I, I thought they'd kept the same writers throughout, to be honest with you. This is ridiculous, Volk, but I guess if you're used to Rick and Moy, this is nothing. Well, I mean, if you can handle Ren and Stimpy, you can certainly handle this. This is so much more gorier and disgusting than Ren and Stimpy ever got. I reckon I would agree, but I think at least if you're familiar with Ren and Stimpy and have watched a little bit of it in the past, you would at least sort of be a lot more... What's the word I'm looking for? I guess you'd have more of an iron stomach for it, I suppose. You'd be more receptive to the content? Yes, that's exactly what I was going for. Thank you for not being an idiot. <laughs> this is what happens whenever I see a mutant pickle. I just shoot on sight. Where is the pickle? <laughs> Oh, 
disgusting. Anarchy at its most base. <laughs> Rick is just a troll for like the majority of the entire show even. He just messes with just about everyone that he can because I guess because he just feels he's that much better and he can get away with it. Yeah, he's very nihilistic with a wicked sense of humour. Actually, that's one thing I can potentially bring up. They did calm it down on the belching, I believe, in Season 2, and more so in Season 3 as well. If there was one thing that turned me off maybe a little bit during Season 1 is that Rick was maybe a little bit too much with the belching. Like, I don't think nearly that much was needed. Well, he's an alcoholic. Oh, yeah, but, I mean, the point was made long ago. I mean, you don't need to keep emphasizing it. Has he left his pickle confines? No, it was a decoy pickle. What? <laughs> <laughs> Receiving explosion. <laughs> Jesus Christ. That was a glory kill and a half, and with only one double A battery? Okay, now I know that this is a work of fiction. Something like that would have taken at least six C batteries. <laughs> <laughs> he turns into a pickle himself. <laughs> no, he's probably going to turn himself into like an aubergine or something. <laughs> what? You know, if this were me and somebody told me to kill a pickle, I just said, you're just fucking with me, aren't you? Yes, well, just do it, pretty please. Well, I suppose if it was a shot of freedom, I guess no matter how insane it might sound, I'd probably still go for it. I don't think I've ever heard of uh, pottery enamel huffing being a legal high before, so who knows, maybe Rick and Morty were just ahead of the curve. Uh, guess you've got a point. Yeah, true. I mean, this is another thing about Rick and Morty is that, yeah, it is just an insane trip most of the time, but I wouldn't go as far as what most people say, like going, this is like super intelligent, but it does have those streaks of intelligence that really make you appreciate what Rick and Morty really is, as opposed to, it's not simply just batshit crazy pickle shootouts. It's more oftentimes a little bit more than that, and it's those moments when they come that really make it a lot more impactful. If it did it all the time, it wouldn't really be that much. But, you know, when it's mixed in betwixt all this insanity, it really, really makes it pop that much more. <laughs> what the fuck are they doing? <laughs> they are kindred spirits. They have patched their wounds and now battle recommences once more. So, I don't... Wait, did he just staple a pickle slice onto himself? <laughs> yes, he did, Volk. Wow. And here I thought I had seen everything. Well, so much for putting it on cable, you ain't got any monitors anymore. Oh, shit. <laughs> I will not be defeated by some fucking pickle! You are a helicopter, you prick. <laughs> Are they really expecting me to take this seriously? <laughs> oh yes, I imagine just coming home to the wife and just saying, well, how's what? Well, I made a business deal with a pickle today. That was something I didn't expect to happen. 
Let me guess, he's driving the helicopter. Oh no, it was him all along. <laughs> that was a big hit right there. Much respect. Bye, bitch! See, this is the thing I both love and hate about Rick. He literally thinks of everything. Like, it doesn't matter what. He's always somehow two steps ahead. And it just frustrates me to know him because it's just like, damn it, why can't I be like that? I just want to be able to just pwn everybody without thinking about it. Ah, uh, Rick Henry, don't worry. It happens to the best of us, folk. Oh, well, I guess I just have to settle with being me. <sighs> <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, right, I'm going. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah, obviously. Um, okay, sure, there's that. Uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure these aren't the same, like, Summer and Beth that were in episode one. Morty is always the same, I'm pretty sure, but these are like alternate universe counterparts. They're functionally the same, so it doesn't really matter. Actually, you're wrong about Morty. That Morty there is actually from an alternate universe where they go into another universe that wasn't just completely wiped out. They killed their own self. Well, actually, the way it worked is that they got into an accident which uh, caused them to die. They then stepped into that dimension where they died, buried their corpses in the backyard, took basically started living their lives as if nothing had ever happened. Ha, huh, okay. And um, during that moment, he was, uh, well, Morty at the very least, was very, very traumatized. But I get the feeling he got over it pretty quickly. Oh, jeez, they're a beloved American institution, Morty. Oh, jeez. Parallel universe television can fix whatever ails you. I think it's uh, the lesson we can learn from Rick and Morty. They have such amazing things during those uh, parallel universe television moments. Like um, the two brothers skip, which was just entirely improvised and just, you could tell it was as well because towards the end, like they couldn't even hold it together anymore because of how ridiculous it was. If you ever get a chance, even if you don't necessarily watch Rick and Morty, like, proper, I would definitely recommend, like, watching some of the Parallel Universe television skip, because those are some of just, like, the strongest improv moments that I think the show has ever produced. I'd like to go back and watch season one of you if you wanted to. Yeah, quite possibly. Um, there's definitely some great episodes in season one and two. Like, one of my particular favorite is the one for Giant Heads that have their own, like, music TV show sort of thing, similar to The X Factor, except they blow up your world if you're not good enough. <laughs> oh, jeez. Oh, that was a great episode. Probably, definitely my favorite one, and I'd recommend giving that one a watch if you get a chance as well. <laughs> I'm no cow, I'm a pickle. Therefore, your argument is invalid. He's, uh... Oh, he chose to be a pickle. <laughs> <laughs> he, he did. There's no doubt in his mind, though. I'm not sure what that has to do about repairing and maintaining relationships. <laughs> repairing a relationship is much like wiping your ass. <laughs> uh, well, she's not wrong in that regard, I suppose. Yeah, sometimes you gotta wipe the crap off in order to get things clean. Ooh, succinct, Vogue. Yeah, and one point. <laughs> and he is bored as fuck. <laughs> Well, at the very least, she has a specific, like, specialty. Yes, I deal with getting people to stop eating their own poop. <laughs> I'll have you know it was pottery enamel, come on. You can't, you can't generalize like that. It's dangerous. Boys barely said a thing this entire episode. 
Yeah, Molly's been very much more of a background character. I'm not sure if that was deliberate for this episode, but... Yeah, I don't know. He's just lit he's just kind of been there, but I suppose that kind of speaks for Morty's character where he's just kind of hoping this all just quietens down at some point so he can live a somewhat normal life. Naked Sticky Rick, by the way. Well, at least he ain't a pickle anymore. Oh, what a lovely family reunion. Ah, uh, yes, but hopefully if you're going out to eat, he should at least put on some underpants, perhaps. Well, you know how Rick do. Or, you know, make a toe grab that rat he disemboweled earlier. So who was uh, Susan Sarandon playing? I'm going to take a stab in the dark and say it was the therapist. I would probably say so, too. I mean, if they're usually credited like that, usually that means they voiced an extra character of some kind. Hmm, indeed. Well, there is a uh, post-credits like credits thing, so let's stay around for that. Oh, yes. If there's uh, extra zingers involved, we must be there, because God knows we've forgotten to do that in uh, some particular anime of note. Let it go. Just a complete non sequitur over an ending. <laughs> well, it's just one of many of Rick and Morty's misadventures, I guess. Yes, yeah, Space Jaguar coming through. Da 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 da! <laughs> <laughs> Solo vanity card Oh uh, Jesus So yeah It was Susan Sarandon As Dr. Wong Danny Trejo As Jaguar Yeah I thought it was And Peter Serafinowicz As the agency director Ah very well then Well there we go We have all our voices But uh Now it's my turn To ask you first So Tom What did you think Of uh the Pickle Rick episode Of Rick and Morty It was ridiculous And I actually Kind of enjoyed it In it's ridiculousness it is probably one of the more insane episodes, but there are some other ones which probably fit just as well. Although I'd say Pickle Rick was probably as up there as it gets in terms of just nonsensical insanity that just doesn't make sense, but you're still blown away by it regardless. Mm -hmm. So, we only have one more episode to check out this time around, and we are going to be watching Season 4, Episode 2 of The Venture Bros, Handsome Ransom. So, uh, I'm ready if you are, Bob. Oh, I am so ready for this, you have no idea. <laughs> Alright, here we go. In three, two, one. Okie Koki, The Venture Bros, is an American adult animated television series. Oh, I'm sensing a theme here. That was created by Christopher McCulloch, also known as Jackson Public, and premiered on Cartoon Network's late night program about Adult Swim, with a pilot episode on February 16th, 2003. First season was on August 7th, 2004. Initially conceived as a satire of boy adventure and space age fiction, prevalent in the 1960s, it is considered to be an action slash adventure series with comedy, drama, Elements. It has been renewed for a 7th and 8th season. The 7th season premiered on August 5th, 2018. It is Adult Swim's longest-running original series, surpassing the former holder, Aqua Teen Hunger Force. Yes, Venture Bros is, I would consider, perhaps the poster child of Adult Swim now at this point. Although, that said, Aqua Teen Hunger Force is still pretty much up there. But I think Aqua Teen Hunger Force is a bit of an acquired taste. Whereas I think pretty much everybody that grew up with the idea of heroes and villains and all that kind of crap can at least appreciate what the Venture Bros is, which is a complete parody of a situation and is more in line of how perhaps people would react to that sort of situation occurring in real life. And nobody does it better than the guy in the TV screen right now, Thaddeus S. Venture, uh. who is the son of um, the super scientist legend Jonas Venture, who deals with arch-villains aplenty during his time, and of course Rusty, being young, would often share the brunt of that, i.e. through being kidnapped and subjected to whatever nonsense the arch-enemy has for, like, their gimmick or what have you. So, Rusty, who he's often called, so Rusty here, he's gotten a bit bored of it and it sort of deals with it in a very cynical way, where it's just like, oh god, not this crap again. And it's sort of become a little bit jaded towards the razzle-dazzled of perhaps planned villainy? And uh, this is the mainstay of the episode, Captain Sunshine, who is uh, 
pretty much like your Superman, I would say, in this case. Like, he's one of the few characters in the show which I think actually has legitimate superpowers rather than, like, having, like, a costume that does extra cool shit or anything like that. So I know about the monarch. I know about his um, girlfriend. I don't really know anything about the series apart from that. So, uh, again, this is like with Rick and Morty, zero context for the most part. Well, good sir, allow me to fill you in, because I absolutely love this show, I watch it more times than I care to admit, so I can actually fill you in and all this. So essentially what goes on in the show is that you have, like, your super scientists and your heroes and all that sort of thing, and then you have your villains. Now, the villains are part of this organization called the Guild of Calamitous Intent, which is a organization that fixes up arch villains with specific uh, heroes or super scientists and they go about a plan of like setting up up as arch enemies and they'd occasionally get into scuffles with one another and then they'd sign the form saying okay this is like a legal arch if you could just sign this form and then that way I get paid. So essentially you can actually be a villain as like a career move which is kind of insane when you think about it. <laughs> Noticing that lady has a guy's voice. Yes, that is the main uh, point of Dr. Girlfriend, or as she is known now as Dr. Mrs. the Monarch. Ah, well, not a mouthful at all. There, they got hitched, I think, in either season... I think it must have been season two or three. But yeah, um, it was a lot more gruff in season one. If you saw, like, some of the original, like, season one episodes... There is a huge contrast between what Dr. Mrs. the Monarch sounds like now and what she sounded like very early on as Dr. Girlfriend. Like, it was very deliberate man voice, whereas now they've kind of turned it around to perhaps fit her a little bit more, but while still keeping to that kind of, I guess, quirk. Well, never let it be said that the Monarch doesn't care about his wife. Uh-huh. I just love the idea of a superhero whose superpower is just blasting you with, like, a solar flow. Pretty much, yeah. And, uh, <laughs> of course, Henchman 21 didn't actually slay the taxi driver. He's a bit of a softie at heart. Actually, Henchman 21 has quite a lot of history to him. He was essentially just, like, the standard bumbling fat henchman whose best friend was essentially Ray Romano. <laughs> but eventually, what happened was is that Henchman 24 died in a horrific accident, which uh, 21 never really recovered from mentally until much later on in the um, series. So he eventually, after his death, he got buff, became the basically the baddest henchman of them all, but still maintained Henchman 21 as his name. Aww. His real name's actually Gary, and he's, um, he, ha he is the head of something called the Atomic Comic Collection Connection. Just throws him down. <laughs> so, Captain Sunshine has, I wouldn't say abducted Hank, but more rescued him and invited him to, uh, his place. Um... You'll know what Captain Sunshine's deal is pretty soon, and um, that gives you a little bit of context, that uh, gravestone there. So the person he was carrying is Henry Allen Hank Venture, voiced by Christopher McCulloch. A teenage boy, one half of the eponymous pair, a fraternal twin with blonde hair. Hank's character is based on Joe Hardy of the Hardy Boys, Johnny Quest, and Fred Jones of Scooby-Doo. He tends to be more athletic and better at disguises than his brother. He is shown as the more outgoing and daring of the two, and more attracted to adventure. In season four, he became more rebellious when Brock had left, even going so far as to lose his virginity. Nearly all knowledge of this event has been erased from his memory, however. Oh yes, that was when he technically fucked his own, like... Oh, I don't know what it was. It was, like, his... Not quite his mother, but, like... Jeez. Stepmom or something like that. There's a lot of weirdness that goes on over there, but, um... Yeah, they went into the memory wipe machine, but, um... Hank actually left himself a message to, uh... Say that he essentially got laid, but didn't actually explain who it was to. Thus to, uh... Preserve the memory with a little more fondness, perhaps. <laughs> a little bit of dignity, yes. Alright, so the big buff guy who's currently on the floor at the moment is Sergeant Hatred. He used to work for the Guild of Calamitous Intent and his theme was like all army battalions with tanks and ranks of infantry, etc, etc. 
but he began to take a bit of a liking to Dr. Venture, and eventually he would quit the guild and become Rusty's new bodyguard in place of Brock Sampson, who is essentially... Well, he was at the time an OSI agent, and he's still kind of doing the whole uh, secret intelligence stuff, and I think at this point... I can't remember if he was technically still in the OSI, if he was part of Sphinx at that present moment in time, but um, Brock Sampson was around, but he wasn't there as a bodyguard. He was sort of there in the sideline doing his own thing with, like, the whole secret intelligence thing. But yeah, um, Sergeant Hatred himself has a bit of a um, personality trait to him. He's actually a recovering pedophile. So, huh? Yeah, he's a recovering pedophile, and... They allude to this ever so slightly every now and again by preying on his weakness. I think at one point they actually tried to um, lure him out by literally putting a small boy into a knapsack in PJs. <laughs> and they literally slipped it under the door. He was just like, no, they're preying on my one weakness. And this sends him into like a huge amount of PTSD and just all but shuts him down. Jesus, that's kind of fucked up. It is, but it's what's really, really cool about this show is that everyone has, like, their own unique character traits. They all have their abilities to grow and evolve as characters. Like, obviously, Henchman 21's a good example. Hank, where he was, like, more the plucky sidekick kind of character, but then sort of grow into this rebellious streak, came to admire Brock Sampson and aspiring to be more like him, and then eventually sort of, like, finding his own kind of groove sometime around season six and seven. I'm just going to allow you to talk as much as you want for this commentary, honestly. Hey, if you, if you have a favourite, go for it, mate. Oh, hell yeah. Like, I absolutely love this show. It's just... It's funny. It's very, very clever. And it's just... It never takes itself too seriously, but it takes itself seriously enough that you can appreciate the stories that it's telling and get some real enjoyment. And the characters really help to carry it. Like, I think one of the, like, less serious moments that they ended up having was, uh, Rusty and Hatred were having a Halloween party, and because the Venture compound is filled with, like, laser turrets and sentries and laser fences and what have you, they were having a competition to see what kids could actually get to their front door in the first place to <laughs> say trick-or-treat, and it came to a point where these two here also joined in, and they were actually making bets in, like, the underground bunker where all the monitors are. So who are these two very Hannah Barbera looking characters then? <laughs> um, the smaller one is Billy Quizboy, who is uh, something of a genius. Very much likes his quiz shows. He is something of a quiz show legend, if I recall. And I don't remember his first name, but I know the rather tall guy is something white. And he's an albino. He hates the sun. And he's sort of more of the cool, suave character. Well, I think he likes to think he's the cool, suave character between himself and Billy Crisboy, but he's a little bit of a goof is probably more accurate, but uh, he has his charm, certainly. What? What is going on, Volk? <laughs> All right. It's not what you think, trust me on this. Like, they lay it on really thick, but it is not nearly as... um predatory as you think it is. There is a uh, more innocent side to the whole application of lube to your butt and inner thigh, as they say. What? So at this point, Hank has basically been groomed into being his next wonder boy. And uh, obviously, Sunshine is very, very happy with this, but... If you go back to when the gravestone was there, obviously something happened to the previous Wonder Boy, and Captain Sunshine has a little bit of a hard time coping with that fact, so he's trying to quickly fill the void by uh, recruiting another Wonder Boy. Okay. And Hank just happened to be there, he had the blonde hair, etc. So, yeah, I guess it kind of just worked out like that. That's why he took Hank and why he kind of just left Dean over there. So there's a handsome ransom going on. Oh, I get it now. Yeah, there's the name of the episode. Yes, that right there shows that whole pedophile thing. It's just like, he didn't know that he wasn't a kid and that he was actually 37. And literally his first thought, so he's like, so you mean it's perfectly legal for me to? Just like, okay, you can stop right there, Mr. Hatred. What the fuck is this robot thing? 
So this is probably more in line to sort of like your Justice League kind of deal, although the Flaming Woman there might tell you more like Teen Titans. Yeah, a little bit. <laughs> it's just like, you're embarrassing me in front of a cool guy. So yes, that was the actual um, meaning of the lube, is to make going down the slide easier. Okay. Nothing more than that. Jesus. <laughs> I love how just like, dude, it's Dean, he's not threatening in the least. <laughs> I like how just generic face entry is just there like, yep, this is happening. This is ridiculous and I actually really enjoy it. It does still have the Hannah Barbera sensibility to it. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, like I said, this widely parodies the stuff like um Flash Gordon, Johnny Quest, etc. Um they do make some more recent like references and what have you but it's most it was mostly inspired by those um tv shows i gotta be honest i really like the animation style and fluidity oh yeah i mean it's much better than it was in uh, season one and two there was like a lot of sort of like stand still with the talking and what have you but then as the later seasons came by and they obviously got a lot more money because the show was generally very well received they managed to up the animation budget considerably and now everything has a much better flow to it and it really helps elevate what was already a fantastic show, to be honest with you. Although there are some things in Season 1 that I do miss, like um, Brock Sampson in Season 1 I have an immense fondness for, where he was quote-unquote the Swedish murder machine, and he was a very, very low-tempered, beefy-ass dude who would just kill anyone who even <laughs> looked at him funny. <laughs> yeah, I know about Brock. Like, one of the most famous moments in season one is where he's actually in the monarch's cocoon. He's just like, you get the boys. I'll take care of these guys. And Rusty's like, are you sure? There's an awful lot. They hit me with a truck. <laughs> and then he proceeds to run over everybody. It was great. Oh, no, he's triggered. <laughs> just shut up. So yeah, obviously he um, dissed the late Wonder Boy, which is the reason why he's getting the beat down of a lifetime right now. Well, he shouldn't have done it. <laughs> oh god, PTSD has never been so hilarious. Indeed. Yeah, Dr. Mrs. Monarch is actually a very, very good scientist, so uh, she understands a lot of this cool crap. Yeah, there's a reason why she says that. The monarch has a bit of an unhealthy obsession with Ventura, but he doesn't like to admit it. Makes for a good uh, dynamic, I guess, between hero and villain. Yeah. At one point, it's sort of like he becomes like super obsessed because he basically loses his arching rights to Dr. Venture much later on in the show, and then it becomes all about him trying to work himself back up the ranks of villainy so that he would be first in line to arch Venture again oh. when he was basically knocked down to... Well, there's essentially levels to how villains work. So if you have basically... A good sidekick, a whole bunch of henchmen, a super high-tech base loaded with equipment, you're probably more like a level 9 or a 10. But if maybe you only have like a small handful of people, maybe you're living in someone's basement trying to get this whole operation started, you're probably more like a level 4. And of course, to get in with the big <laughs> cheeses like Dr. Venture, you gotta be like a level 9 or 10 at least. Ah, I wonder who that could be on the right, Rog. Oh, yes. Um, you probably imagine each of their secret identity evolves in being as part of a news team. It's essentially like Anchorman, if you think oh, about it. I fucking love Anchorman. I actually watched that with Helldragon. Well, he was watching it for the first time with me, I guess. Uh, the, script, the story is schlocky, but it's one of the funniest fucking movies I've ever seen. I do rather like it, and I do like the part especially, I think it was in Anchorman 2, where they had, like, all the, like, anchor teams from all over the world, like, coming together to this massive scrap. 
That was amazing. That's just an extension of a joke from the first one, but whatever. That's what movie sequels do in terms of comedies. That is indeed true. Uh oh, the monarch's out for revenge. Looks like a floating turd. <laughs> no, that is the flying cocoon. We're not entirely sure why he decided just to make it a flying cocoon and not, like, a massive butterfly ship or whatever, but I suppose the cocoon hides the henchmen within, so I guess it makes sense in that regard. Okay, so seeing anything Monarch-related kind of sets him off. Well, it's more that Monarch's in his home turf, and he, um was the first one for capturing Wonder Boy to begin with, and he thinks he's trying to take him back. And obviously, he's only just, in theory, gotten Wonder Boy back, so Captain Sunshine is a little bit hysterical, to say the least. Dude, you, you can fly. You don't need a helicopter. No, 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 Fink. His name is Captain Sunshine. Oh, I see. Powerful in the sun, weak at night, I guess. <laughs> oh, this bit's good. <laughs> oh, this is having no effect whatsoever. <laughs> it's like, dude, you're being a dick right now. What the fuck's wrong with you? Yeah, this is all purely accidental. Hank is not actually this skilled, although apparently he is skilled enough to be able to be considered for enrollment in Sphinx, although that never actually happened in the end. Uh, Brock managed to convince him otherwise through saying that he had to be over 18. What is Sphinx? Um, Sphinx is a... I think it was like an old villain thing, but um, some ex-members of OSI recommissioned it to sort of be like a step up from the OSI. So as well as the Guild of Calamity's intent, you have... um essentially your law enforcement, and there are some that are specifically to do with ensuring villains are kept in tabs. So it goes something like this. If someone's pointing, a, if someone is uh, holding you up or, like, threatening you, you call the police. If someone's holding a gun to your head, you call SWAT. If they're wearing spandex and they're pointing a super laser at you, you call the OSI. And if they're wearing regular clothes and they're pointing a super laser at your daughter, that's when you'd call Sphinx. Okay, needlessly specific, but I get it. Also, this is all of Sunshine's worst fears come to light. What the fuck is going on? <laughs> so obviously, um, he thinks that Captain Sunshine is a little bit of a, um, uh, yeah, but, um, we all know that that's just a, um, misunderstanding. So uh, obviously now Monarch's in on his secrets, so, uh, what's he gonna do to, uh, press the advantage? Isn't this just going to recharge his powers? Yeah, I reckon you're probably right there. <laughs> Without revealing too much, but of course, <laughs> they are shooting super enhanced sunshine rays at him. I mean, that's going to power him up. Yeah, and just random narration. <laughs> oh, it's slightly bright. Ah, I can't look at him. It's all like the whole thing where you take like a magnifying glass and like put it against ants and what have you, or use it to like melt your old army men figures. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> oh damn. So hurt right now. Ah, uh, poor old Captain Sunshine. And there it is. You know, as much as Hank is a bit of a goof, he does have those odd moments of maturity to him. <laughs> well, I wouldn't know, but I'll just take your word for it. This is so messed up. Oh. Uh. 
Is he going to kill him? No. But I don't think he's going to be too happy with Hank after this is all said and done. <laughs> yeah, Hank is also a Batman fan. Um, that's something you don't really get much here, but in other episodes, he is uh, very much talking up the Batman. Oh, I saw Kevin Conroy. That Was he playing uh, the Sunshine Guy? I believe so. I'm not entirely sure, to be honest. It wouldn't surprise me if he was. It would explain the whole putting the good word to Batman for me segment. Let me look this shit up. Sunshine, Venture Bros, Sunshine, Captain, Sunshine, Chuck, Scars, Dale. Voiced by Kevin Conroy. Yeah, there you go. Oh, there we go. It all comes together. I actually completely forgot. <laughs> well, at least he got darted and he wasn't slain. Oh my god, there's still so much I can talk about and I've run out of time! Well, sorry mate, that's just the way the cookie crumbles with these commissions. So yeah, that was Season 6, Episode 8 of Archer, The Canes, Season 3, Episode 3 of Rick and Morty, Pickle Rick, and Season 4, Episode 2 of The Venture Brothers, Handsome Ransom. Thank you, Mauricio, for commissioning these. We had a lot of fun with them. Uh, before we uh, sign off, what do you think of uh, that Venture Bros episode, mate? I wouldn't go as far as to say it was one of my favorites, but it is a very good episode, in my opinion. Just from having um, Captain Sunshine there and his spiel, he does actually come back briefly for a couple of more episodes afterwards, so you get a little bit more idea of like what his character was and sort of like how he progresses through the uh, ever-expanding world of the Venture Brothers. Mm -hmm. And there's just a whole lot going on. You've got like, the side story between Hank and Captain Sunshine. You've got the whole hostage situation going on to hilarious effect. You've got Sergeant Hatred trying to do the whole covert operation and ultimately leads nowhere. It's just an all-round good episode. I'd say that it's definitely one of the better ones, but um, some of the best ones... Um, I'm not entirely sure how best to describe them, but um, there was that wedding scene that features uh, David Bowie. That was pretty fun. I'm going to cut you off there, otherwise we'll be here all night. Thank you, Mauricio, for commissioning these episodes. Remember, guys, if you want to help support HFC and get some cool stuff, check our prices. They start at $25 for an hour's worth of TV comms. You can have, like, what happened here. You can have uh, three completely different shows, one episode each, or you could have, like, six 11-minute episodes, or you could even, like, mix and match. I will leave it up to your hearts and imaginations desire. See you next time for another batch of Hellfire comms, Patreon TV comms. Bye-bye.